Hello, Jenna, and we're chatting again. Another podcast that's always a fun opportunity to talk about issues on estate administration, and hopefully we can illuminate and make simple areas on, on estate administration. And today we're going to talk about investing estate assets on that. So I, I credit where credit is due. You picked this topic, and I appreciate I think it's a good one to, to chat about because it's an important part of the executor's role and responsibility is to provide properly care and manage for the assets. Obviously, the first thing would be just to, okay, find out what the assets are and preserve them, make sure they're safe if it's physical assets and they're properly insured. And we've talked about that in other in other podcasts. But once you've got to that point, you're formally appointed, you've gone through the probate process, you also have to think through, now, what do I do with these assets, right? And, and sort of the message I think from today is that there is a responsibility and an expectation that you properly invest those assets assets, much like the deceased person would not just sort of put money in in the mattress and not earn interest on it or invest it properly, that there there is an obligation, obviously, to maximize the value of the estate. The beneficiaries are going to be quite interested in that. And the larger the estate, the greater that risk is of mm -hmm. maybe not doing a good job on that and not receiving a proper rate of return. With that being said, you also have to be careful with regard to how you invest it. And there is a concept of a prudent investor standard that's out there that governs decisions that you're going to make with regard to investments. So as we think about this topic, certainly point number one would be that prudent investor standard may be different than how you invest your hard-earned savings. It may be different than how the deceased person managed their investments. And so rather than guessing, you absolutely need to get some advice with regard to how to properly manage those assets, because it's not an answer to say, oh, the proverbial, I put it in the mattress, right? I earn nothing. That's not going to make it, except if it's a very small amount and the cost of managing it or investing it, you, you would get so little money that it's there's more administrative costs in trying to do the investment than you would actually earn on interest on very small estates. But if you're certainly you're, you're getting into higher amounts, you have to address your mind to how do I maximize this, this asset? And then secondly, how do I minimize the downside? How do I minimize the risk of it going down in value? Do you maintain an investment in in, a, in the stock market, right? If somebody had investments and there's suddenly a market correction, that's a very awkward conversation with the beneficiaries of going, well, I know I told you that through the probate process that the value of the estate was X, but now it's X minus Y because Y represents the loss because the market has done a correction. And we've all probably lived through some of those market corrections, right? And, you know, so you want to you wanna make sure that, that you get an appropriate upside without risking the asset and minimize against against the downside and make appropriate decision given the nature and extent, or I guess the, the nature of the asset. What you do with the business asset might be different than a digital asset, which is different than real estate, which is different than stocks and bonds, mm -hmm. right? So you got to look at each of those and say, what's the best way of managing it? Because that's part of your report to beneficiaries of here's how I've done it, right? And you can't say, oh, I don't know anything about investment, so I did nothing. Well, that the beneficiaries, particularly if they're if it's a contentious matter, will hold you to account of, well, you should have gone some advice and you should have obtained the answers. If you didn't know, you needed to go and find out for that. So that's I think where you can bring in the professionals to tell you, well, what's what's your recommendation and what's a conservative position so we're not jeopardizing the assets, but yet not missing out on some clear opportunities to enhance the value, right? If, you know, keeping $500,000 in the bank, earning no interest for a year would create a problem. Like, oh, you could have right. earned thousands of dollars if you had just put it in a very safe GIC, right? And it would have been backed up and, and secure in the bank. So thoughts and, and comments with what I've been uh, rambling here a bit, but uh, give me some of your thoughts and, and reflections on, on the topic of investing in estate assets. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, when you mention about GIC rates, I think you can get around a 5% return right now in a very safe vehicle. So I, I completely agree that reviewing the investments as soon as the deceased passes passes away is important. Getting professionals to advise you on the assets the deceased held is important. Um, and I think one of the most common areas that uh, executors can get into trouble, and I know we've touched on in a previous episode, is is managing a portfolio of stocks and bonds and, and et cetera. Because it, as you mentioned, the deceased may have loved you know, an aggressive portfolio and high risk, 100% equities, but that's no longer appropriate for 
for the estate. The time horizon for the estate is much, much shorter in most cases than the time horizon of the deceased um, before they passed away. And so you might have to have enough cash for expenses, liquidity needs. You might have to make distributions at certain periods during the administration. And you don't want to have to sell those assets at an inopportune time, especially when the markets are down. So if you do a, a review immediately after the deceased passing, you get a sense of what you should do going forward. Meet with the professionals, talk about an appropriate risk mandate, and also consider, you know, consider talking to the beneficiaries about what they want to see in the portfolio. If it's a straight administration and you're not setting up any trust asset, then that might look different than if you are setting up long-term trusts that are supposed to be in existence for 20 or 30 years. You might also consider who the beneficiaries are. If it's a charitable organization, maybe they don't want the assets to be sold because they can take it in kind. And, and benefit from the reduced capital gain tax. So there's certain things that professionals can highlight. And I think the important theme here is, is uh, review it right away and review it with the right people. I like the idea about consulting with the beneficiaries because that may provide some opportunities to make decisions on the administration of the estate, which mitigate against the risk of having to do these long-term investments, right? One thought would be, and we've talked in other episodes about making sure we do a timely administ- you know, a distribution within the estate. The sooner you can wrap things up and do the distribution in the proper course to the beneficiaries, well, if you shift that asset to the beneficiary, now it's their responsibility to invest it. And you've you've now capped and limited the period of time where you've been the person in charge of care and management of that asset. So you're mitigating risk by ensuring you get it into the hands of the beneficiary as quickly as possible. Now, as we know, that can't happen immediately. There, there's a period of time where you're respons- you definitely want to be managing that asset. So you just need to turn your attention once you have the legal authority to the, you know, what is appropriate. But bearing in mind that if you are prudent with regard to the speed at which you are administering the estate, that solves some of these problems, right? But there may not be a choice. If there's litigation, it's going to take a few years to sort that out. Well, what happens to the funds in the meantime? You know, you got to take a look at the time horizons. That's going to be different if you think then, you know, I'm going to distribute in three months versus three years. And the investment strategy would have to be altered to to make it fit the circumstances, right? And then looking at the, the nature of the, the nature of the asset. So it is, there's not a one size fits all and you always have to do this. You have to look at market conditions. You have to look at the nature of the assets. But the good news is you don't have to have it all figured out, right? right. You don't have to be an expert in this area, but you do need to go get that expertise. You need to hire that person. So that would be something that you would you would want to get that person on right away. The other thought that comes to mind is that we talk about the same strategy as the deceased. You may want to consider whether you're using the same advisor as the, as the deceased did, right? Just because they did it on their own and they were, you know, the trading stocks, uh, you know, themselves doesn't mean you can do it yourself. But if they really were getting advice from their neighbor, you know, regarding the investment portfolio, well, that's not the standard that is on you saying, well, you can continue to use the neighbor. If the neighbor is qualified, great. But it was just, he was the neighbor day trader (laughs) for stocks. That's probably not the right person that you want giving you advice on how do I comply with my legal obligations uh, and investing this, these funds prudently, right? So you may have to seek out, you know, an appropriate advisor and it may not be the person who has the history with the file. I guess I should add that as well. You got to make an independent assessment of who's the right person and maybe talk to a few different ones and then determine who you want to use. There's no obligation to say you have to use advisors that have been there historically for the deceased person. Not a bad place to start because they have the benefit of the history, but if they don't have the expertise or you're not getting a good feeling, like you're going, okay, I'm not sure that this is appropriate. Get a second opinion. Like look at somebody else, right? Uh, you want to be you want to be conservative, I think, on this to say you want somebody who is really understands the rules in this area. I would presume most people in the financial industry would be aware of those legal obligations, but maybe they're not, right? Or they, they're they not staying up with continuing education and they, you know, you need to bring in somebody who's qualified on, on that. And, and it could be your responsibility if you pick the wrong person and you didn't check their credentials or uh, make sure that they are qualified, right? To be able to uh, provide that. So you got to dig a little bit and you got to make that, you got to do the discerning, if you will. Well, I think that's, that's a great discussion and great tips. I would also like to highlight, you know, as you mentioned, Gord, the the risk of the downside needs to be protected 100%, but also the risk of the loss of the upside and be prudent on both both ways. So everyone, thank you for listening. We hope to see you next time and uh, we look forward to our next chat. As always. 